Uh, yeah, I just want to start by thanking Aintas for the opportunity to be here today. Um, yeah, it's really great to, to talk to colleagues, I, I suppose, from across the sector and to highlight the work of a particular partnership called CELTA. CELTA is the Irish for worldly wise. I, I think we need a worldly wise in, in this world that we live in at the moment. So, yeah, my name, is, as mentioned, was Bobby McCormick. I'm the CEO of Development Perspectives and Programme Manager of CELTA. And CELTA is a consortium that involves a number of organisations as well as development perspectives. So we've got Aintis, of course, Irish Rural Link, Concern Worldwide, and the Department of Adult and Community Education in Minute. And essentially, that, that is a strategic partnership with Irish Aid to embed development education within the adult and community education sector. So there's an awful lot of work that goes on in Sailta, and my colleague Mark in a couple of minutes is going to speak to you particularly about the research elements um, and I suppose some of the, the ongoing work that's happening in that area. But my task really is just to present an overview of Sailta. But I look forward to then, of course, later on having a chance maybe to answer some questions or to provide clarification on any of the points made. So if you don't mind, what I'm going to do is because of course, you know, respecting the fact that we're all diverse learners, I, I want to share a video with you. It's just a couple of minutes long. It's an anim animated piece that was done for us by Luke Holland. Um, hopefully you enjoy it and it'll give you an idea visually of what's involved. And then for those that are a bit more, you know, results based framework orientated, I'll take you through that uh, briefly. I won't uh, scare you, don't worry. So I'll show you the animated piece to begin with.
So hopefully for those that are visually orientated, that gives you an idea of, of what's involved. And um, if you don't mind, though, what I'm going to do is just to, to share with you, if, if you like, I suppose, just some of the nuts and bolts of the strategic partnership. So I'm going to share a different um, view, if you like, of the same program of SAILTA. Um, so I mentioned earlier on to you that I suppose what we're trying to do is to embed development education within the adult and community education sector, but maybe just to begin by talking just briefly about what development education is. So when we refer to development education, what we're talking about is some of the major challenges that our society and communities face, things like poverty, inequality, climate, gender-based violence, racism, and the list could go on and on. But development education is also about then moving people into action, not, not just learning about these issues, but actually working with citizens to come up with solutions to these issues, whether that be in Ireland or indeed in an overseas context. And within development perspectives, we, we do have partners across the world that we work with as well, not just within, I suppose, the consortium within an Irish context. So that's the, the outcome. And that's essentially what we're working towards as a consortium. Now, just to, to kind of like show you how that's kind of broken down a little bit, we have different priorities. So there's the sectoral support, if you like, and um, that's very much around partnership, which we're doing in the consortium. There's the practitioner support. So working with adult and educate adult and community education practitioners across the country. And um, there's the research end of things, which Mark is going to talk about. And then there's the actual provision of lots of development education opportunities as well. So that's that's what we're trying to do within SAILTA. And from, from I suppose a target audience point of view. We, we see it as happening in different uh, spaces. So you've got the ACE practitioners on the, the right there, which is much more, you know, tutors within maybe FE institutes. But then on the community side of things, community advocates or leaders, maybe those that might be involved, let's say, within, you know, a softer form of education, more on the informal end of things. So maybe coaches, social workers, that type of space, if you like. So there would still be advocates and leaders within their community. They would be involved in educative processes, but maybe not in the, you know, working towards, let's say, formalized learning outcomes. So that's important to mention. And then there's the adult population more generally, which we're trying to engage with, as I mentioned, through our partners. I won't bore you with all of the exact program outcomes because that's really getting into the detail, but I wanted to mention it because in case anyone is interested in asking further questions at a later stage, feel free to just drop me an email. I think what might be of more interest though, to our friends on this webinar today is more about the particular kind of activities uh, that we do within, if you like, SAILTA. So the Sustainable Development Goals, oftentimes the abbreviations are used far too much SDGs. So that's a, a list of 17 goals that was developed by the United Nations back in 2015, of which one of them is quality education, but they cover a multitude. They cover things like environmental issues. They cover things around poverty, inequality, hunger. And so what we try to do as one part of our program of activities is to have an advocate training. So this year we had 81 applications for the 26 places from across the country. But we have workshops then regularly on the Sustainable Development Goals. So last week on Monday, we engaged with Monaghan Women's Network um, on gender equality. On a Thursday of the week on, we engaged with Cluid and their kind of like the, the housing association around, you know, sustainable communities and housing and homelessness was the focus of that. So SDG 11 and 12. The training of trainers, and I just want to highlight this to all of you, we do have a call that's open at the moment, especially for those that are living in the northwest of Ireland, looking at training of trainers. So, of course, there's lots of opportunities to get involved in SAILTA, but this one is live, I suppose, and the, the closing date is in the next day or two. In fact, it, it is tomorrow. I'll put the, the link into the chat space in case anyone might be interested in a, in a last minute application. And again, you see an awful lot there, like we engage with local government through PPNs. Uh, we have network events. So last week we had a network event, you know, involving AD and O'Doherty from T DCU looking at campaigning, but also the role of art and social change was explored. So how can we in education involve things like murals so holly pereira talked to us about that and music with luke can cannon how can we involve music within our work because of course we're trying to engage people that may not be um 
positively inclined to maybe I suppose some of the educational processes that are more traditional, let's say. So we're trying to engage people in creative methodologies as well. So we have a whole range of webinars, podcasts. And just to say to you, and I will share again this link into the chat space in a minute, that we do have lots of free resources on the sale to websites. We have 17 information packs. We have an information pack for um, community educators involving the SDGs and for further educators. So there's an awful lot there. We provide coaching and mentoring. And we are working, which Mark can maybe touch on briefly, we are working with the eight ITE providers, the initial tutor education providers, to try and get development education embedded more into the curricula there. Um, and as I said, Mark will talk a little bit more about the activities. So we're doing policy submissions all the time, as of course many of you will be engaged with. And we, we try to work where possible with partners. Of course, there are gaps and it's just to say that we're trying our best to do as much as we can, but we're still limited by the resources that we have to do that. So we're, we're, we're limited with some of the work that we can do with further education institutes. We would like to do more of that. We're limited in some of the work that we can do with some of the sports, the national governing bodies. So we are trying to engage with, with those national governing bodies, but we need more resources to do that more thoroughly. There are specific geographical areas across the country that have far less opportunities, far fewer opportunities than let's say some of the cities like Cork, Galway, Dublin. So like Midlands and Northwest are two areas that have fewer opportunities and we're conscious of that and we're trying to figure out what we can do about that. And then indeed worth saying that like the marginalized groups that exist right across the country and there's many of them and arguably far too many to, to really give justice to, but we are conscious that we need to do more in that space. So that hopefully gives you a little bit of an overview of what's involved in SAILTA. Um, I, I'm going to be, of course, hanging on to try and take as many questions later on as, as I can. I will, in the interim, put the link to the training of trainers and to the resources into the chat space. And I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Mark, who's going to talk to you more about the research end of SAILTA. Hello, Bobby, and thank you for that introduction. I'm just going to check in to see if people can see my screen. Okay, yeah, thanks for that, Bobby. So, yeah, um, my name is, is is Mark, and I'm the research officer uh, here at Sail to DP. Uh, I came on board uh, back in September. Um, previously, I've worked for ten years in community and adult education, so my background is in in this field, and more recently in higher education, um, which was uh, scary. And so I'm glad to be home. Uh, very, community education is very much my home space. So um, I'm glad to be working with like-minded again. So as, as Bobby said, I'm gonna talk you through uh, some of the research that we're currently engaged, focusing in particular on the mapping exercise that we uh, undertook last year. I've got a quick quiz though, before we, hang on, Kieran's waiting to get in. Somebody let Kieran in, thanks. Uh, just start off with a quiz, just a quick, you know, a quick mind bender and it's fill in the blank. So the world's wealthiest 1% now owns how much of the world's wealth? So I'd like you to just maybe cogitate or think about that particular question as I go through this, but not too much. I want you to listen to what I'm saying. So, uh, but I'd like you to cogitate on that question and I'll give you the answer at the end. So without further ado, I want specifically to talk about this mapping exercise that we started back in uh, September of 2020. And I suppose the, the, the purpose of this was to start to um, chart or map who's doing what in the whole dev ed space, who's working with who, what, sub, what sector are they working in of community education or adult and community education, uh, what kind of uh, learner profiles they're working with and so forth. So we issued uh, 460 plus uh, surveys to adult, maybe you got one of these, I don't know, uh, but we issued 461 surveys to adult and community education providers right across the sector from FE colleges to FET centres to the CEN network to the IDEA network and so forth. Uh, we got back, I mean we're, we're talking here I suppose at the, you know, in the middle of a pandemic here, so you know, but still the, I think the returns were on the low side, so we got 58 returns 16 of which were invalid and we finally had 42 entries that made it in made it into a final report that was published back in December. Um, and I suppose one of the main reasons that I'm here today is to first of all flag the report, secondly to um, 
uh, to, to maybe incorporate some of the members that are here today. Um, and, you know, looking at that last, that, that last entry there, we had a very low number of entries from community education providers and from the CEN network in particular. So I'm hoping that as we, uh, we go through this process again this year, that we get a better representation from uh, the CEN network members and from community education generally. Um, I'm just going to give you, before I talk about other research that we're doing and so forth, um, I'm just going to uh, maybe give you a flavour um, of what we found in the report or what kind of entries came in. So here are just some of the um, some of the groups and projects that uh, are, are, are mapped in the report. So it's everything from community education to local NGOs to, the, to people working in the FET sector. We also had entries from social enterprise organizations and small but also larger NGOs. So just to give you an example or a flavor, uh, the Roscommon Women's Network, now they were doing a range of intercultural projects and trainings uh, up there in Roscommon and probably previously wouldn't have described themselves as being doing uh, development education, but indeed they were because they were touching on many of the issues and concerns uh, that Bobby raised there or Bobby point, pointed highlighted uh, in the SDGs, uh, such as gender equality or, or racial inequality. So they were a group that hadn't maybe previously defined themselves as doing dev ed, but very much were doing. And then there was some more obvious ones, such as uh, the City of Dublin ETB, and specifically their community education programs. Um, Changemakers in Donegal, which is community development, but also community work and community education. And they work uh, closely alongside Donegal ETB. Um, others maybe that perhaps you wouldn't have heard of before, the Donegal Intercultural Platform. That's a local NGO up there in um, Donegal who uh, do work around uh, interculturalism and, and racial, uh, racial issues. Um, but also we have uh, Dunboyne Further Education College and the CTIA who are a social enterprise project or over in Galway. And then the obvious ones, the, the larger uh, international NGOs, such as Concern. Sorry guys, I've got an ice cream van outside my door here. So he obviously wants me to go and buy an ice cream, but I'll resist and we'll carry on. So those are some of the people who um, took part. Um, now I know Bobby's maybe given you a definition of, of development education. Uh, and it was very nice. And he talked about the, uh, the, um, the SDGs. But for those of you who are maybe still vague on this whole area of development education, I came up as part of this presentation this morning with my own definition, which I think is actually quite nice. So in my definition, and again, this is probably a new field for me going back to September, uh, in my own kind of uh, understanding of different development education. This is about creating a fairer, more just and sustainable world by engaging learners in issues that affect their lives, but which also have global significance or impact. So you'll find if you start reading the literature on this, it's, you'll find this word locality come up uh, uh, quite often. So it's about interconnect or, or helping people to make connections between their everyday lives, but also how that impacts globally. But it's also development education, it's also very much about taking action on these issues. And maybe we'll get into some of that when we get into the later um, breakout rooms. So that's, um, and just to the right there is a graphic that I particularly like from Irish Aid, and that's from the National Strategy document, which lays out some of the issues and topics that are incorporated within development education. So you can see it's a large smorgasbord of issues that you out there might already be working on but may not define that as being development education, but we can help you with this. So some of the specific questions that development education attempts to address. And again, this is my, this is my own, very much my own take on it. So some of the questions that you might be working on with your learners are, you know, what is the impact of globalization on local populations as well as populations globally? Uh, why is it that vulnerable groups, and, and I'm particularly referring to women and children, uh, so for the impact of war and conflict. Um, and why is addressing the issue of north-south inequality impo important for achieving a, a more sustainable world? And on the issue of sustainability, how can we work and live in a way that protects our natural environment, but also has a less, less, of it, a less impact on, on those economies that rely more on natural resources? 
So these are some of the questions that you might work with your learners on. Um, and as the graphic there on the right hand side, I don't know whether you can see that or whether our, um, our window here is in the way. Uh, I'll go back to that, sorry. Yeah, uh, development education um, to, relies heavily on participatory methods. So we're talking about transformative learning methodologies, but also maybe uh, some of you may be familiar with critical pedagogy and the work of Paolo Freire, where it's very much an emphasis is on active learning methodologies and participation. So that, that's, you know, that's uh, something that's a hallmark of development education. And maybe again, we'll talk about a bit more about this in the, in the breakout rooms. So, Here's the meat and the drink, or meat and the sandwich, I should say, is we need you to tell us if you are doing development education. And if you're not, of course, you can come and say, well, are we doing it? Or what can we do to be doing it, if you see what I mean? And if so, who you're working with and what particular issues you're working on. And if you're not doing development education, or you think you might be doing development education, or you are doing development education, so also consider how you might incorporate or deepen your dev ed practice in your community education practice or context. And, and just, just to a reminder here at the bottom that development education is not really so much adding to what you're doing already, but it kind of means doing things differently. And again, we can provide you with the capacities and the help to do that. So just a bit about some other research, oh, sorry, just a recap. So we'd like you to be involved in this mapping exercise. Uh, we'd like you to be more involved in development education activity. We can provide help and our directions towards support, funding and resources for this. Some of the other research that we're doing and Bobby mentioned there, we're currently involved in a project which is looking at embedding development education in ITE programs for those working in adult and community education. So there are currently eight um, higher education institutes across Ireland that run programs specifically, uh, teacher training programs specifically for those who are working in the adult and community education sector. And indeed, you may have participated in one of these yourselves, or you may know people who have already. Um, and as part of my, um, in addition to my own work with SAILTA, I, I also work in Marino College on their further education program. And that's kind of keeping me hand in with, with the sector. Um, but I'm also uh, in the very early stages of developing a piece of action research. Uh, I'm working specifically with those who are working on the ground uh, in terms of embedding development education in their context. So this is people who are who have no experience of development education, who have not implemented development education methodologies or issues or content in their teaching, but who are interested in, in, um, in doing this. And then hopefully that will help inform other people who are, have an interest in this, but don't know how to go about it, I suppose, is probably the best way to describe it. So again, we're, we'll probably get into this in more detail as we go through the go into the breakout rooms. But uh, thanks for thanks for listening to that short presentation. And um, if you want to take part in the survey I I I this year, uh, please please contact myself. And of course, B Bobby's email is is there as well. If you if you want to find out more about a bit more about the the other work that uh, development perspectives and sale to do, um, our web address is there on telephone, and I presume that Barry will uh, share these slides with 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 the and this webinar with you at a later stage. If you want to come back and and have a look at at this content in, at your leisure at a later stage, I'm sure those uh, resources will be available. Um, just to maybe flag some um, resources that uh, may get you started, or or may help to inform you more about development education and the work that we do. Uh, the mapping report is, is uh, a soft copy of the mapping report is available at that particular web address. Uh, you can find things like the uh, Code of Good Practice on the IDEA website. Um, Irish Aid, you can find information on the Irish website, uh, including the National Strategy for Development Education, but also funding opportunities. And in terms of building your development education capacity, uh, again, you, you can please visit our, our own um, resource bank but also developmententucation.e who have a lot of resources in this area. Um, oh, so just to answer the question, is the, world, the world's wealthiest 1% owned 50% of the world's wealth in 2017, which is actually up 4.5% from 45.5% from 2001. 
So the rich are getting richer, it's the old cliche, and the poor are certainly getting poorer. So um, that's, I think that's all from me. Yes, it is. That's the end of my slides. So thank you very much for listening. Uh, that was just a quick, very quick run through of what we're doing. So hopefully we can get into a bit more discussion and debates in the course of the uh, breakout rooms and subsequently. So thank you very much for listening. And thanks to the Aintus gang for setting this up. Sure, Katie, thanks so much. Yeah, so in my group, we kind of we kind of broke off the discussion talking about whether we thought there were aspects of development education already um, kind of in our fields or in our courses. And where people were saying that unfortunately, those who were kind of involved in um, kind of QQI learning outcomes and accredited courses often found that unfortunately that space wasn't always necessarily very clear to them or very there. And when you are focusing on like very specific learning outcomes um, and very quantifiable goals for learners and kind of again, looking at that, like learning for work, learning for skills, attitude to learning, maybe it wasn't that apparent or it wasn't that easy to incorporate those goals into their learning. And then we kind of, we also were talking to, I know Mary from the LCN was saying that um, as community education network, they have kind of a bottom up approach to a lot of their, to a lot of their programs where learners can actually feed back on what they feel I feel they need in front to themselves and the community and the world around them so we thought that was a really good example actually of how you can incorporate those things into programs but unfortunately that didn't seem to be the case kind of across the board in terms of the members of my group so yeah that's kind of a, a brief overview that's great Kellyanne thanks Mel. Sam do you want to give a quick yeah I mean we we covered loads so uh, just one of the things that kind of jumped out to me and anyone in the group can can uh, can um, uh, jump in at any moment was around how much uh, we all do work in the area of development ed to various different degrees and in different ways, and how much the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, provide a fantastic framework that's quite accessible. And if there was more public awareness uh, around them, it would be it would be a fantastic leap ahead. Uh, and how much domestic awareness people here think about the SDGs, if they know about them at all, as, as one person mentioned, was that they think about it in terms of applying really only to people in other countries, particularly the developing world, the global south, whereas actually it's very much as much in tune with what's going on here right now locally. And that kind of came back to the term of global, which I think uh, Mark raised in his presentation earlier. And um, But loads of really interesting points. So that's just the, the tip of the iceberg. Thanks, Katie. That's great, Sam. Thanks, Millian. Um, AJM, do you want to give a quick summary of your group? Sure. Uh, it was a great... It was a great, uh, you know, group uh, discussions all going on in our um, breakout room. Actually, we, you know, some of us were working for disabled people, the other uh, for elderly people, and we had a mu music teacher in our group, and Bobby was there too. Uh, we focused on the digitalization and its positive and negative aspects a lot, uh, because when it comes to community education and also when we were certainly working for, let's say, elderly people, digital world just made our, um, you know, collaboration and also the social aspect of adult, adult education is not effective in that way. And we are trying to find some solutions for that, uh, maybe involving more people in our uh, activities. And Bobby gave a great example about their SDG bicycle project which they are planning at the moment. And it was, I think, really inspirational. And at the same time, uh, the fundings all around uh, for those blended approaches and also new approaches, we just focused on there too. Please jump in if you also want to add the other group members, but we were mainly talked about that. Thank you. That's great, Ajan. Sounds really interesting. I might go to Orla and then we'll come back to, to um, Bobby and Mark and we might just put some questions, just some ideas about like that raising awareness, but also examples of best practice, especially in the more formal education and some ideas of how we can integrate that. Do you want to go ahead, Orla? Sure, yeah. So I think the majority of the conversation was discussing, you know, how do we entice people towards developmental education without you know, scaring them away in terms of the language that's used, how to encourage people to engage with it and see the benefit, not just for themselves, but their community also. So we spoke a lot about empowering our, you know, people in our community, the people we work with and the people we engage with day to day. So it's sort of really interesting conversations and ways to do that. And um, just generally, you know, interesting conversations about the difficulties as well that are certainly encountered and that um, just, you know, basically being very positive about how we move towards that and 
uh, there is good examples of, you know, what carrot is used to, you know, bring people towards it and then, you know, um, just the ways in which the, that's possible. So that was kind of the conversation that was had. So maybe just a, a just one or two things just briefly before handing to, to Mark. I mean, I think as educators, I think we're so used to working with the lived realities that people face day to day. And I think that that's a better starting point than starting with, let's say, talking about the sustainable development goals or development education, because I think that can become a little bit disconnected from what people are going to through daily. So like as an example, there's a, a case that's very hot at the moment in, in Drogheda looking at the River Boyne. And as soon as you begin to talk about pollution in the River Boyne, well, then you're automatically starting to talk about SDG six and 14 you know clean water and sanitation and life below water and then it becomes relevant and once it's relevant I, I think you know half the battle is is already won so so I think that starting certainly with people's lived realities is really important and things like misinformation and racism and gender-based violence these are huge issues in communities right across the country which development education has built up a huge kind of knowledge bank in dealing with so so these are are issues that really affect everywhere to a certain extent and and lastly just to mention i suppose it's it's a carrot for the sector more so than an individual but there is financial resources available through irish aid uh, through their annual grant call that some of the ETBs that are on this call or some of the practitioners that are on this call, if they're involved in organisations structurally, why not look at the possibility of getting some of the resources to allow you to do work, maybe outside of QQI pressures or alongside QQI? Because again, I suppose we, we have to be conscious of both elements, the formal and the non-formal. So I'll, I'll hand over to Mark. Yeah, and it was, um, I mean, Bobby echoed there something that came up strongly in our breakout room discussion was how do you engage people in these issues and just echoing what Bobby was saying there you know your best starting point is to is to connect this into the live reality of people people's live realities to what they're experiencing in their lives and in their communities um, I mean after 10 years of working in adult community education myself my mantra is always, always start with the, your learners' experiences as a jump off point for exploring a whole range of other issues that impact their lives. So, and I suppose the, the mantra would be, you know, education is always more effective when it's real. So, um, yeah, there, there, maybe there is some work to be done here around the language and stuff that maybe might be off-putting for people. But certainly when you're beginning to explore, you know, when you begin to explore development education issues and the SDGs, it, it, it is really fruitful to start with, you know, the live re people's live realities and what, the, what they're facing at the moment. There's probably still people at the end of this who are, the, the question's probably going around in their head, do I do development education or do I not do development education? So if you're still unsure, please get in touch with either myself or Bobby, and then we'll start that probably journey of, of, of helping you to map that within your own organisation and maybe also deepen your own knowledge and, and, and capacity to deliver development education going forward. A specific question around the QQIs. Again, I, just, I, suppose the, the, I suppose the guide here is not doing what you're doing differently, but doing it in a different way, if you like. So not adding to existing uh, learning outcomes that are there in your QQI standards, but maybe also maybe incorporating development education uh, into your existing practice. So it's not reinventing what you're doing. It's just, you know, evolving what you're doing to incorporate development education issues. And again, there are resources and there are, there's help out there for you to do that. And indeed, some of the research that I'm hoping to do this year will provide concrete examples of that. Uh, just to give you uh, a brief example, I'm working with uh, some tutors who are working down in a college down in Sally Noggin for their education college. They work on an art and design module, and I'm exploring how that they can. Now they're coming from a non-dev ed background. I'm exploring with them how they can map on development education into their existing QQ on modules. I've said enough, so back to the main session. Thank you. <laughs> that's great, Bobby and Mark. That's been so useful, and I think yeah. you know th that's really good advice in terms of making it relevant uh, to people within their own communities and, and making that real in terms of starting the, those conversations which sometimes I think can be difficult when you look at, at some of those areas 
And I think in terms of Aintis's perspective, this is a new part of our um, strategic plan. It's a brilliant opportunity for Aintis staff, for myself as well. I've learned so much today and it's an area that we're really passionate and committed to, to make sure that we really look at um, supporting members, I guess, with resources through um, sales and development perspectives. Um, and we'll keep this conversation going. This is a starting point, like Mark is saying, we will send information out after and please do contact um you know sales to development perspectives and i guess i'm thinking from uh, sharing be examples of best practice sometimes might make it you know a really good opportunity sometimes yeah. when we're talking about this it's quite difficult but i think those examples are fantastic because it really allows people to look at what else is happening i know roscommon women's network were the winners of our our, our new star award around sustainable development through education and they're model is absolutely incredible and should really be rolled out on, a, on a, a broader scale as well so we'll absolutely keep this conversation going with resources supports but just a huge thank you to, to bobby and um, and mark for this really informative session and please get in touch with us if you want further information and we can give you bobby uh, i know bobby's put his email there and mark surely will as well so we would really encourage you we think it's you know we've seen the impact of, of these programs across ireland and more broadly um, and it's really within the values and ethos of Aintis and with our members as well. So it's something that we are going to be very committed to and trying to forward this on. So thank you again for taking the time to join us uh, this afternoon. Please do find out other webinars and no doubt we'll be talking about uh, sustainable development goals again throughout the year and keeping this on the agenda. So huge thank you to everyone for taking part and um, we hope you enjoy the rest of your week and hopefully Easter weekend.